Chris, Christopher Shade is the founder and director of CEO, or founder and CEO of Quicksilver Scientific and continues to be the driving force of development and innovation. Dr. Shade's vast depth of knowledge, passion for healing, and intuition, intuitive understanding of chemistry and biology are reflected in Quicksilver Scientific's well-designed detoxification protocols and unique supplement delivery systems and patented mercury speciation testing. He's a recognized expert on mercury and liposomal delivery systems. He has lectured and trained doctors in the U.S. and internationally on the subject of mercury, heavy metals, and the human detoxification system. His current focus is on the development of cutting-edge lipid-based delivery systems for nutraceuticals, such as liposomes and microemulsion systems, to address the growing need for high-quality, affordable detoxification solutions. Please give a warm welcome to Christopher Shade. Thank you, Janet. Uh, so it's uh, good to be back here again. I always love uh, coming and speaking to IOMT. Uh, I tell people the first uh, lecture I ever gave was for, uh, you know, in, in this world was for Dietrich Klinghart in this hotel on the day of my 40th birthday. And the second one I gave was to IOMT. And so I have a lot of history here. Uh, talking about mercury and pathways for mercury detoxification. I'm always interested in bringing to light the mechanisms involved in it. And if we know the mechanisms better, we know how to use all of our tools more. Now, we're going to go a lot further than just detoxification. I'm going to be talking about uh, detox metabolic fitness, and I'll be talking about AMPK activation, which is a trigger... Uh, is something that's triggered when you fast or when you carb restrict, and it's involved in getting into ketosis and uh, efficient metabolism. And, uh, of course, we'll talk about mitochondrial health. Uh, Mark Danola was uh, talking to me yesterday and, and about something or other, and he goes, everything's mitochondrial dysfunction, isn't it? And I'm like, yeah, all problems really are. But then we're going to bring these to bear on immunity and longevity. So I'm going to talk, uh, you know, because of COVID, we're going to see what the overlap is uh, in detoxification, metabolism, mitochondria, and COVID. Because when you look at the people who are susceptible to really extreme COVID, what do they have? They have cardiometabolic disease. Those are problems in AMPK, problems in sirtuins, problems in mitochondria, and it turns out also problems in detoxification. So these people tend to be metabolically unwell, and uh, toxic. And it turns out COVID downregulates NRF2. So what is NRF2? NRF2 is our master switch for turning up chemo prevention or chemo protection. So that's free radical control, detoxification, and, uh, and it keeps our cells in a highly reduced environment. So it's keeping up our glutathione levels. And glutathione, we all know, is something that's really good for detoxification, but we're going to talk about how central it is to immunity. And so in this study, they looked at autopsies of COVID cases, and they found that they are epigenetically downregulated in NRF2. And then the contrary to that, people are looking at uh, NRF2 activation as a strategy against COVID to keep it uh, from, from beginning, and certainly to keep the symptomology, the pathologies for getting out of control. All right, so uh, looking just at glutathione, which is a subset of things that's under the control of NRF2, uh, we've known for a long time that toxins, so these are endocrine disruptors that deplete glutathione uh, in antigen-presenting cells, promote Th2 polarization leading to exacerbation of airway inflammation. Th2 is a more allergic type of uh, inflammation. Uh, Th1 is more going after infections. Th2 is more reacting to things. And it has a partner with it that's highly reactive called Th17. And these get way upregulated when glutathione levels go down. And glutathione has also long been known uh, for the its uh, inversion with infections, anything that lowers glutathione, uh, alcoholism, uh, pulmonary disease, cystic fibrosis, these different diseases, lower glutathione, and turn up the incidence of other infections. And I'd mentioned 
the effects on the lungs, this is a big deal. When uh, glutathione is low, you are particularly susceptible to lung injury. Now, one of the things that glutathione makes is nitrosoglutathione, and nitrosoglutathione is a direct antimicrobial. But uh, the bigger thing to the lungs is when there's low glutathione and you have a site of infection, there is a movement of, uh, I believe, neutrophils into the, into the lungs. There's a big movement of inflammation into the lungs. And the inflammation doesn't stay at the site of the infection. So when glutathione is down, inflammation moves to the lungs. And this is why so many old people uh, die of pneumonia. And of course, this is a really big deal uh, in the time of COVID. So NRF2 is about more about uh, environmental detoxification. And then for inner detoxification, uh, which is the relieving you of the burden of yourself, is AMPK. Uh, so AMPK, I said, is activated when you have a low caloric intake. And it's actually, it's not low caloric. It's when, uh, when carbs are low and ATP levels drop, AMP kinase is activated by the growing AMP amounts and mobilizes resources. It'll mobilize glycogen and stored sugars for use. It'll increase uh, movement of GLUT4 transporters into the membrane, so you're becoming more efficient at using the sugar that you have, and you, of course, will mobilize fats as ketones. Now, coming along with it is a very important thing called autophagy. Most people have heard of autophagy uh, by this point. And autophagy or self-eating is when you take either parts of cells, uh, like mitophagy is taking damaged mitochondria and putting them into a sort of liposome within the cell and it fuses with a lysosome and you degrade the old organelle and you use the materials to make new ones. So this is super, super important. And the way you know which ones to break down is that there's signaling tags that accumulate on damaged membranes of the mitochondria. So mitochondria, or membrane damage is one of the ways that you can get mitochondrial damage, but it's important that we go in and we break down these old mitochondria, and then on the flip side that we make new ones through mitochondrial biogenesis. Now, AMPK starts this process, and then it's furthered by the activity of sirtuins, and sirtuins are NAD-dependent uh, deacetylases, and if you have enough NAD, then you will not only do mitophagy, but you will also then do mitochondrial biogenesis. So it becomes, uh, NAD becomes this huge thing that's holding up the whole system by holding up mitochondrial activity. Now, there's other versions of, uh, or of autophagy, but this one here, xenophagy, is super important to us. Uh, and looking at in, uh, autophagy and immunity and uh, infection control, xenophagy is taking a virus or a bacteria or a parasite, bringing it into the cell and doing the same thing, forming an autophagosome around it so you can break it down into parts that are recognized by your immune system so you can form these secondary antibody responses to the microbe. And so uh, this is why people who are in poor metabolic shape are more susceptible to infections and deeper, more damaging infections. Uh, AMPK activation is also uh, associated with sting genes. These are interferon-inducing genes. And you know, in, in COVID, you have, of course, the virus entering the cell through the ACE2 receptors. And in the process of that, damaging ACE2. So ACE is part of the renin-angiotensin system. There's ACE1 and ACE2. ACE1 is a pro-inflammatory, driving up hypertension mechanism that's really for use when you're bleeding out very heavily and you have to conserve blood. ACE2 is the counter one, which is anti-inflammatory, and this is the one that's built up uh, by things like vitamin D and vitamin A, and AMPK creates balance and strength to the ACE system. And so uh, these people with 
ACE2 issues are people with cardiometabolic problems and high blood pressure. And so these are the people who were much more affected uh, by COVID. Uh, AMPK is also, I, I mentioned, it goes along with the sirtuins. This thing, PGC1-alpha, is the trigger for mitochondrial biogenesis. So when you have AMPK activation and NAD levels uh, that are high, you will generate more mitochondrial density and you will be more metabolically fit. Uh, mitochondria are the core of everything. They generate the energy for everything, and they generate the energy for the immune system. So this paper, mitochondria, is the central hub of the immune system. So we'll see through this, if we want to keep our immune system up, and all these things relate to the immune system, and they all relate to longevity. They all work together. So we need to constantly be detoxifying. We need uh, fasting or carb control, and we need a lot of NAD, and then the system will work very well. And of course, everybody knows about the mitochondrial basis of aging. Uh, that's been very well established over time. So I want to talk more about NRF2, and Dr. Paul brought up NRF2, and I'm going to further that. We're going to talk about cellular and systemic detoxification and liver pathways, and uh, then we're going to look at how they overlap with AMP or AMPK and how AMPK is centrally regulated in the liver. And then we'll uh, end up talking about NAD. I put in a bunch of slides at the end. And I'm going to talk kind of quick because I want to get to them about treating people post-COVID. Uh, or during COVID, but really post-COVID people have a long, lingering, inflammatory issue that goes on uh, that can be very difficult to deal with. And so I'm going to talk about some of the strategies for dealing with that. Uh, NRF2 is this, if this circle in the middle is uh, the nucleus, out in the cytoplasm there's a protein pair called KEEP1 and NRF2. And when certain things go in and activate a change in the conformation of KEEP1, then NRF2 is translocated into the nucleus and upregulates transcription of a number of chemoprotective genes that have this thing called the antioxidant response element promoter region. And these genes code for uh, antioxidants and modulating enzymes, detoxifying enzymes, molecular chaperones and proteases for removal of electrophilic and oxidative stress. Electrophiles are like oxidants, but those are more environmental toxins, uh, all moving towards self-survival. And this is uh, essential for the survival of the cell and of the organism. And you find all the original research of, for this was in cancer journals like carcinogenics or, uh, or mutation research because these are mechanisms that protect the DNA. Uh, here's Martin Paul's paper, NRF2, Master Regulator of Detoxification, also antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, and cytoprotective. Uh, what it's bringing up in the body is this whole system of chemoprotection. Uh, and in the middle of this are the antioxidants that we know and love, like glutathione, vitamin C, vitamin E, lipoic acid, CoQ10. But these we used to think of as the heroes of the game, but they're really driven into their respective functions in all of their compartments through the enzymes that drive them. And uh, these are antioxidant enzymes. So when glutathione is being used to quench lipid peroxide, it's going through the agency of glutathione peroxidase. Then it's going to be oxidized glutathione, and we need to re-reduce it, and we do that through the enzyme glutathione reductase. So we have these reductases. If we're using glutathione to repair oxidatively damaged proteins, uh, we'll use glutaridoxin. Uh, glutaridoxin also under periods of stress will tack glutathione onto active sites of proteins to turn them off and protect them during that period of stress. And then when the coast is clear, it'll come back in and clear those off. Uh, and then detoxification, we have enzymes that use these as well, like glutathione as transferase is linking glutathione onto mercury, cadmium, arsenic, mold toxins, a number of different environmental toxins, and then these transporters are pushing them out of the system. Now, when we have this active, we form what's called chemical resistance. So this is 
looking at the elements of that detox system. Uh, it's talking specifically about the transporters, but it says MRP proteins as potential mediators of heavy metal resistance in these zebrafish cells. And I like people to think about resistance versus susceptibility. Not that there's one level of a toxin at which we all get sick. We all know that that's not true. That's a simplistic look. When our detoxification system is actively working at a cellular level as well as a systemic level, and we'll talk about cellular versus systemic, but here we're talking in cells. When it's active in the cell, the cell is constantly pushing the toxin out of the cell and protecting the cell. So if it's circulating through the body, but the cell is keeping it out of the cell, uh, then you're really you're more resistant to this toxin. But if these things aren't working in the cell, then the toxin gets you. And indeed, they surveyed all these cells for cadmium-resistant cells, and they found that they were cross-resistant to mercury and arsenic. And when they take the cells apart, they find that they have high synthesis of glutathione, high activity of the conjugating glutathione as transferase, and high activity of the transport proteins that push it out of the cell. And in fact, that's how detox works in a cell. If you've got mercury in there, you need glutathione, you need a linking enzyme called a transferase, and then you need a transmembrane transporter called a multidrug resistance protein. And then you're pushing stuff out. And they found that these cells could just swim in these metals and not have a problem. But if they blocked any one of those enzymes or transporters or slowed them down, then the cells would die. And so when we turn down detoxification, things that we were exposed to before and okay with suddenly become very toxic to us. And there are times in our life where this happens. You know, as we get older, yeah, our glutathione levels are going down, our NAD levels are going down, and we're going to see when we look at NAD, we think about NAD in reference to metabolism and oxidative metabolism, but there's a reduced form of NAD that drives reductive metabolism, specifically regeneration of glutathione. And so with age, that system is going down. And then NRF2 has uh, co-activators, including the pregnane X receptor. And pregnane X receptor is activated by pregnenolone and progesterone. And so you'll find that women, as they head into perimenopause, their detoxification systems are going down. And those amalgams that they've been sitting with and dealing with suddenly are very toxic to them. So there are a number of things that don't regulate detoxification. Inflammation is the biggest one that does it. And the biggest inflammagen that, we're, that we get a lot of exposure to is endotoxin or lipopolysaccharides or parts of bacteria. And you'll get them from leaky gut. You'll get them from periodontitis. In fact, periodontitis, that's why it's correlated with heart disease and depression because depression is neuroinflammation. And at the end, we're going to talk about neuroinflammation because it's the biggest thing that lasts post-COVID. And in this model, uh, this was a, a worm model exposed to methylmercury, and they could toggle on and off NRF2. And if NRF2 was in place, everything was fine. But when NRF2 was shut down, the methylmercury caused Parkinson's-like symptoms. So NRF2 is very big protective-wise, but it's a big regulator of the redox poise of the system keeping things highly reduced. So in this paper, they're talking about the downfall of NRF2 leading to a number of different things, including telomere attrition, mitochondrial decay, uh, genomic instability, leading to systemic inflammation, uh, which we often call inflammaging. Uh, the, the biggest uh, culprit in this is NF-kappa-beta, which has come up uh, in Judy's talk and Dr. Paul's talk. Uh, so keeping NRF2 up is a way to keep all of that down and a way to protect the cells from this downward spiral. And in fact, I talked about telomere attrition and mitochondrial dysfunction. Those lead to senescence of the cell, which is a sort of death phase of the cell where it's releasing pro-inflammatory signalers and causing decay in other cells around it. All right, so the cell level, we need all of those things going. And uh, if this is a cell up here, those reactions are happening and popping the toxins into the blood, then they have to be filtered at a systemic level by the liver and kidneys when everything is working well. And if we go into the liver, 
Uh, I love to look inside my little liver picture, and this is a hepatocyte, a liver cell. Every hepatocyte is fed on one side by blood and drained on the other side by bile. And drained by bile, what, is, what does that mean? Now, we know that the liver produces bile, and bile is there for digestion of fats, emulsification of fats, but this is actually the transport system for the toxins to leave the liver. So these transporters up here, MRP2, moves toxins and bile salts. BSEP, bile salt export pump, moves bile salts. These are twin transporters. They're co-regulated. They're upregulated and downregulated together. And the other thing that's driving this is phosphatidylcholine going through the MDR transporter. And so phosphatidylcholine is being donated from cell membranes all the time into the bile flow to fluidize the bile flow and protect uh, the epithelium of the bile tree. So every cell is drained by a little rootlet of the bile tree that all co coalesces down into the common bile duct, then goes into the gallbladder, then into the GI. And so bile flow is synonymous with toxin flow. And if you have cholestasis, you then have blocking of the bile flow. So cholestasis is blocking of the bile flow, it's blocking of the toxin flow. And so we'll talk in another slide about the kind of things that block that. So here we have uh, bile salts going in uh, from enteropathic circulation, we have toxins going in, we have phases of detox, and you see these two transporters that go out. Now these aren't a big deal under good circumstances, but under bad circumstances, they become the way that you dump bile salts and toxins out of the liver, and why would you do that? You do that because you can't get them out through the bile. So when things block the normal flow, and inflammation is the biggest blocker, then everything gets dumped out of the cell. These, this is what happens when people have bad detox. If they're trying to take things like lipoic acid that upregulate detox, but they don't have bile flow, the liver, they're gonna have these reactions when the liver back flushes and dumps into the blood. Those toxins are then going to go to the kidneys and cause kidney distress. They're going to go to the brain and cause neuroinflammation, and they're going to come out through the skin. And first you'll have itching because the bile salts go under the skin and they cause puritis or itching. And then you'll have rashes as the toxins come out and you have immunological reactions to them. Uh, this is just a picture of the nephrons and the kidney. They have the same transport system that is present uh, in the liver. All right, so how do we upregulate NRF2? Well, there's a number of different things that do it. Polyphenols uh, like quercetin uh, and, or EGCG, and then sulfur compounds like sulforaphane or lipoic acid are very good upregulators. Now, you notice I say up here, phytochemicals and their radicals. We used to think, and I would always play with people, I would say, you know, so lipoic acid, is it an antioxidant? People say yes, and I'd say no, it's pro-oxidant. Uh, and a lot of things under certain circumstances are antioxidants, but in the cells they end up being free radical generators, light free radical generators, ones without collateral damage. You know what else is an NRF2 upregulator? Methylmercury, arsenic, phenobarbital, but that... They're doing that by stimulating a danger response and turning up NRF2, but they have all these bad properties. So we're using natural compounds that are reactive enough to upregulate NRF2 for us, but don't cause collateral damage. And you'll see reactive oxygen species, nitrogen species, sulfur species, all stimulate this because it's a stress response. And that's why ozone is an NRF2 upregulator. All right, so now let's look at that liver and turn it all red. And if it's all red, then we know things are bad. So this is when there's inflammation blocking the bile flow out. So when the inflammation gets high, you turn down the transporters into the bile canaliculus. And you actually turn up these transporters that move things out of the, out of the liver. That's where you're dumping all this stuff out because the liver cells are going to die because they can't get rid of this stuff. So they just throw it back into systemic circulation while all this trouble is going on. And then when things are cleared up, you go back to that. So what are the things that cause this and cause this system to go backward? Well, look, estrogen's up there. Estrogen is a 
cholestasis developer. That's why women get uh, cholestasis during pregnancy. And so if you're in a period where you're estrogen dominant, you're going to have this. And estrogen also works on the brain as a glutamate uh, stimulant. So that's why estrogen dominant makes you irritable and anxious. And that's also putting you into stress. It's putting you into sympathetic dominance. Well, sympathetic dominance and stress are one of the things that also block liver flow. And then, contra you know, what's the antidote to estrogen but progesterone? And if you taste it, it's the most bitter of all the hormones, and it is great at opening up the bile flow. And in the brain, it acts on the GABA receptors and enhances GABA activity. That's why progesterone chills you out so much. In fact, when I was being a prick, my wife would make me take nanoprogesterone to make me a little bit nicer. <laughs> and... If endotoxin, and, and I didn't go through all these other things, but endotoxin is one of the biggest things that drives this. And one of the biggest places we get endotoxin are from inflamed intestines. So when we're not eating the right food for us, we have food allergies, uh, when we have dysbiosis, we're going to have leaky gut, and we're going to get that endotoxin in. It's going to block liver, going to block kidneys, and it's going to activate neuroinflammation. All right, so what kind of stuff can we do to support detox? Uh, these are compounds that I use the most. Uh, there's a formula that I use that's got these bitters in it. So we're using bitters to open up bile flow. I mean, even if you took Angostura bitters that you make a cocktail with, it's going to help you open up bile flow. It's got a lot of gentian in it. So I use myrrh, gent gentian, dandelion, and solidago, which is more of a kidney support. Phosphatidylcholine is a big thing for opening up bile flow. Remember, the PC is needed. And in fact, going low on PC or going low on choline so you can't make enough PC is an instant generator of cholestasis. And that's why, you know, one of the reasons that all these calls to, you know, not take choline uh, because of TMAO is a bad news, is a bad idea in my opinion. So then there's some other things in there, quercetin, luteolin, and DIM are mast cell stabilizers, stabilizers and immunotolerance generators. People know DIM for its use in estrogen metabolism, in focusing estrogen metabolism into uh, metabolites that are non-carcinogenic. But DIM also on immune cells causes a shift from Th2 to Th17 polarization, which is a hyperinflammatory polarization often associated with autoimmune diseases, and it shifts them over to uh, T helper cell or T regulatory cell dominance. T regulatory activity is more immunotolerant. So while you're moving these toxins around, you want to make sure you're not having reactions to them. And the quickest way to stop detoxification, remember, is inflammation. So if you're activating mast cells during your detoxification or you're activating them by all these botanicals, then that's going to block detox. So it's good to have them in as stabilizers. And then NRF2 upregulators, lipoic acid is our lipoic acid is my favorite to use. And when I don't want to upregulate but I just want to dra drain the liver, I'll use the bitters and the PC but no lipoic acid. So uh, DIM also works on NRF2, and it's got two different things. It is an NRF2 regulator, but it also unlocks NRF2 from epigenetic blockages to it. And uh, in prostate cancer development, they find epigenetic blocking of NRF2 that is uh, turned back on by DIM. And we see that also, uh, we haven't found the literature around it, but we see that with mold cases. In molders, NRF2 downregulation, and, it, uh, and DIM works fantastically on that. Now, now that we're seeing that there's NRF2 downregulation epigenetically in COVID, then DIM would be a good thing to bring in there. Uh, luteolin and quercetin also, and silymarin, are all NRF2 upregulators as well. Uh, just want this slide in here to highlight the importance of membranes. Membranes are exquisitely designed things that have all these transporters in there. Uh, when we look at lack of membrane control, uh, such as in, in uh, Martin's talk, uh, you know, then you have calcium moving into the wrong places, and you have inflammatory generation. 
So membranes, you know, Bruce Lipton famously calls them the brains of the cell. And we tend to think about the outer membranes. But the inner membranes of the cell are the endoplasmic reticulum, the mitochondria, the Golgi apparatus. And you see the endoplasmic reticulum is this massive folded up membrane that encloses the nucleus. So the nucleus has all the programs that are available to us, but we have to decide which ones to use. And who is deciding that? The membranes are all working together to decide based on their resources in the extracellular environment and the intracellular environment what to do uh, with its potential, what to express. And what's really brilliant is if you uh, perturb the membrane potential of the cellular membrane, and if you change the voltage of it, the endoplasmic reticulum responds instantaneously with an equal and opposite voltage change. So the endoplasmic reticulum is in this quantum coherence with the uh, outer membrane, and then the endoplasmic reticulum uses, touches up against, it has all these tubules that touch up against every other membranous organelle and use calcium signaling to discuss the situation, get information, and bring that to bear on what genes uh, get expressed. So uh, phosphatidylcholine is one of, the thing, uh, one of the therapies that I think is just fantastic long term for building resilience in the system because how do you even measure mitochondrial strength? It's measured as the membrane potential. And so high PC, good membranes, high membrane potential. So let's switch over into AMPK. Uh, so AMPK, just to look at it uh, another time, AMPK gets activated uh, by exercise, where you use up the ATP, you build up AMP, and your body's saying, oh, I need, I, need some more, uh, I need some more food. And that will cause you to mobilize uh, stored, stored resources. Uh, nutraceuticals activate it through liver kinase B1. There's actually a couple of mechanisms that nutraceuticals can activate it, but one of them is through liver kinase B1. And this is where things like metformin work as well and put you into a more efficient metabolic state. Now, when AMPK is activated, you block mTOR. mTOR has two directions. Forward is building mass, and blocked then brings with it the opposite, which is autophagy, which is cleaning things out. So what activates mTOR are insulin and branched-chain amino acids. So when you're eating uh, a lot of carbs, you're always mTOR forward, you're always growing, you're storing fats, you're not burning, and you're not going in and clearing out old damaged cells and organelles. So, uh, and then it brings with it adipose triglyceride lipase. That's breaking down fats. And it's blocking ACC, which is synthesizing fats. All right, so AMPK is a big metabolic switch. But I'd said it's highly regulated in the liver. And when you look at liver dysfunction, uh, livers proceed from normal liver to fatty liver to fibrotic liver and cirrhotic liver. And uh, here, this is a paper looking at uh, fibrosis, development of fibrosis, and they have all these triggers moving you into fibrosis, viral infections. In fact, one of the things we see with COVID and post-COVID is high liver enzymes, and people are starting to see reactivation of old viruses like Epstein-Barr, and in the liver, especially cytomegalovirus. And so this continuing lingering infection inflammation in the liver. So viruses do this, alcoholic, non-alcoholic, fatty liver, biliary obstruction, and toxins. There's carbon tetrachloride. And then they have MPK activation to reverse it. Now, adiponectin is released when we're in good metabolic states. Curcumin and anthocyanins are uh, nutraceuticals. And then metformin, phenofibrate, those are, uh, <coughs> those are pharmaceuticals. And I think I just saw phenofibrate being used for COVID. And in the liver, what are these things that happen? So you have liver kinase B1 activating AMPK, block, blocking anabolism, increasing catabolism, and increasing cell polarization, which means membrane polarization, and leading to things like tight junction formation. So 
AMPK is helping seal up leaky gut and seal up leaky liver. In fact, there is such a thing as leaky liver. It's increasing cytoskeletal organization and canalicular trafficking. Sorry, Griff, I tried to come out and speak at your conference, but I was picked up at the airport for canalicular trafficking. I always knew it would happen. Uh, canalicular trafficking is bile flow. So AMPK is helping us detoxify. And wouldn't you know it, there's all this crosstalk between AMPK and NRF2. Now, this is all about AMPK on fatty liver uh, and some of the things that activate it, like quercetin and silymarin, uh, relieve fatty liver through turning up autophagy through these AMPK triggers and sirtuin triggers. So the way to think of AMPK and sirtuins, AMPK is the beginning of it, and then sirtuins are the completion of it. But the sirtuins require NAD. Uh, and this is just on the tight junction formation through uh, AMPK activation. AMPK is also blocking immunological reactivity. Uh, this is across the GI lining. And so it's sealing up tight junctions and relieving some of the food reactivities. So turns out in all of these uh, compounds that we like to use, almost every one of them are AMPK activators. And there's a functional medicine guy named Cheng Ruan who uh, used this system on 102 fatty liver patients diagnosed with ultrasounds and uh, blood markers and got 82% resolution of fatty liver in one to two months and uh, relieved a number of, of gallstones and shrunk the size of all the other ones. That's how I even got into looking at AMPK. I'm like, how the hell did that happen? You know, because everybody wants to think, oh, yeah, you take the toxins out and then everything's fine. Well, it turns out in the metabolic activation in the liver, lipolysis is a big thing. So you're burning up the fat accumulation in the liver. Now, this is about AMPK driving NRF2. So AMPK facilitates nuclear accumulation of NRF2. So there's all this crosstalk between the two. That's why in all my time, you know, helping people detox, the people who fasted got rid of mercury the fastest or got rid of all kinds of things the fastest. And so carb restriction, intermittent fasting, water fasting are all going to greatly help detoxification. So you can take the compounds that are AMPK activators, but if you do it along with the lifestyle factors, you're going to get the best results. Uh, and yeah, we can skip through that. All right, let's get into some NAD. It's looking like I'm going to cover all 70 slides in 60 minutes. Anybody who gives talks, that's a lot of slides to do in 60 minutes. So NAD, it's like the wonder molecule. You know, if there is one thing to go after to change your health and change longevity, it would be NAD. NAD is massive in redox reactions. Like I said, one form of it is driving oxidative metabolism, burning up of uh, your carbs and, and, uh, and your fats to make energy in the mitochondria. And the other half of it is driving reductive metabolism to re-reduce oxidized glutathione, uh, thyroidoxin, uh, other antioxidants. Uh, it's big in circadian rhythms. So it gives you energy by day, but it's activating through its sirtuin activating activity, the clock genes, which make you sleep deeper at night. And people, uh, quite a few people have found when they're taking NAD precursors that their deep sleep enhances. Uh, it is there for DNA repair. This is one of the reasons your NAD goes down with time is you're accumulating DNA damage and NAD is sucked into the nucleus to repair the DNA. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's a big part of epigenetics. It's there. It's often called the guardian of the genome. Uh, and probably its biggest role is in driving mitochondrial function. So it affects every part of you. Here you have all these different things that are affected positively by it. And what is it? We have driving NAD formation, exercise, diet, and NAD boosters. And also, the converse of that is that when NAD is down, all these pathologies develop. And what are these pathologies? You know, obesity, fatty liver, uh, cardiac hypertrophy, vision things, type 2 diabetes. These are all cardiometabolic. 
So NAD is the guardian of the cardiometabolic health. And NAD has an oxidized and a reduced form, so NAD plus and NADH, and you want it dominantly as NAD plus. That's the sirtuin activator. But when you overdo carbs and you don't exercise enough, you build up the reduced form NADH, and that is then down-regulating your this metabolic advancement that you're making when it's more oxidized. I said that NAD and sirtuins work together. Here we have slowing aging by design, the rise of NAD and sirtuin activating compounds. These two work together. Uh, so NAD, one, in metabolism, it's bringing electrons from oxidation of the carbon substrates into the electron transport chain to drive ATP. But then the other things it's doing is activating sirtuins, PARPs, and CD38. And sirtuins are taking that process begun by AMPK and codifying it and bringing it more deeply into your metabolism and f affecting all these organ systems in a positive way. Uh, and one of the things that it does is increase, uh, here we have the same idea, it takes two to tango, NAD and sirtuins in aging and longevity control. And this is the nucleus and that's the mitochondria. There's a crosstalk between them that's intricate and super, super important. They have to be on the same page all the time. And that discussion between the two is driven by NAD activation of sirtuins, making these signalers like TFAM come across to the mitochondria and activate all of the best aspects of the mitochondria. You'll also hear uh, genes or genes called FOXOs, and they're similar to sirtuins, and they're actually controlled by sirtuins, uh, and they're also longevity things. Now, a couple of years ago in Denver, Michael Oshner was speaking on this paper. NAD supplementation attenuates methylmercury, dopaminergic, and mitochondrial toxicity in this little worm model. And in this paper, when they dumped this is NAD level in the whole worm, and when they dump methylmercury into it, the NAD tanks, goes down to about 40% of its normal amount. What else tanks? I don't have it on here, but the mitochondrial density goes down commensurate with that. So here we have it as a mitochondrial toxin. But if they pre-treated the worms with extra NAD and they kept the NAD levels up, now, that methylmercury, instead of decimating the cell, becomes a hormetic toxin, and uh, you keep your NAD levels up, and in fact, with more methylmercury, you actually synthesize more NAD. Now, they found that when the methylmercury is applied to the worms, it's these red staining or oxidative stress in the worm. So, methylmercury caused this massive oxidative stress that then killed the worms, uh, but this is the, the measure of the oxidative stress. If you pre-treated with NAD, you didn't have any of that. And here, why is all that? Because of glutathione. So glutathione dies off when you overdose with methylmercury, but if you pre-treat with NAD, you can keep up with the demands and synthesize more uh, glutathione to keep the organism from dying from those toxins. So NAD is driving uh, all of that ability to resist the toxins and keep the mitochondria up. It's really a downward spiral, and you'll see I have the Matthew effect on, on this. To those who have shall be given more, and they will have abundance. For those who have not shall be taken the very last bit they have. That is how NAD is. That must have been the whole idea of the parable. It was about NAD. And, of course, like all great things, it goes down with age. So that's our NAD going down in brain and skin, and, and all these processes go down with it. All right, so how do we make NAD, and why do they go down? So we make NAD either through the Price-Handler pathway, which is, uses uh, nic uh, nicotinic acid or niacin, and a couple of steps becomes NAD. So NAD is the high form of niacin. And or the de novo pathway, you can make it from tryptophan because you don't always have niacin in your diet. And you make NAD and then kicks in the salvage pathway. So NAD gets used by a sirtuin and it turns to nicotinamide. And then you have enzymes that bring it back to nicotinamide mononucleotide, NMN, and then up to NAD. And you keep cycling 
like this. And if you don't cycle like this, NAM builds up and it's actually an inhibitor of the enzymes that it, that it feeds. So you need to keep this moving. That means you need this enzyme heavily at work. And what happens to that enzyme, this is why things go down, is NAMPT, the uh, enzyme that brings it up to NMN, it gets blocked by aging, inflammation, ischemia, degenerative disorders, but generally inflammation is blocking that. There's two reasons it's going down, really. Inflammation is blocking that enzyme and also the accumulated DNA damage is activating PARPs, which disproportionately pull NAD out of the mitochondria into the nucleus to stimulate gene repair and then starve the mitochondria. So when we want to supplement NAD, there's two high-end uh, precursors that work. Uh, nicotinamide riboside was what was used before. Uh, and now nicotinamide mononucleotide. Nicotinamide riboside becomes nicotinamide mononucleotide, uh, and then that becomes NAD. So either of those work quite well. Uh, just to give you an example of what happens when NAD levels are, are low, that discussion between the nucleus and the mitochondria, well, it turns out when you make the electron transport chain, some of the genes come from the nucleus, and some of them come from the mitochondrial DNA. And when NAD levels are low, the mitochondria stop, they don't transcribe enough copies of their proteins. And then you have non-stoichiometric levels of the proteins in the electron transport chain. And what happens is you get this high energy flow of electrons into it, and then there's a missing protein. And instead of going into ATP, all that energy goes out as free radicals and then further damages the cell. But then when the NAD levels are up and sirtuins are activated, the messenger TFAM uh, is then signaling to the mitochondria and keeping them on the same page. And if you're AMPK activated at the same time as this, then you'll actually get mitochondrial biogenesis as well. So I just mentioned the two compounds that people use, uh, NR and NMN. Uh, the people who make NR used to say that NMN does not work because there's no transporters for it. But in 2019, in February, uh, they did find the transporters. And uh, NMN is a great supplement for driving NAD. And it had been used uh, for years in animal studies. And now there was a study, I don't have it in here, at George Washington University looking at uh, elderly, overweight women and NMN. And it had uh, very beneficial effects. Now, the one thing with, let me just get this all through here. There we go. The one thing with NAD that people often miss is it has to be balanced. Uh, if you're supplementing NR or NMN, you are going to build up nicotinamide, and you need to drain the excess off, uh, and you have enzymes that methylate nicotinamide, and then you pee it out as methyl nicotinamide. Now, the cofactor for that is S adenosylmethionine. So you're consuming, when you drive NAD, you consume methyl groups. And when you consume them, then you build up homocysteine. So you need to be stimulating the regeneration of methionine, either through TMG supplementation, that's the short path, or the long path that's MTHFR mediated, uh, where you'll need some methyl B12, uh, B2, a little bit of B6, and B9. So it's important to balance methylation with it. In fact, I found this anthropological biochemistry paper looking at the development of different civilizations and how good their cognitive health and metabolic health was. And it said that it came, it was talking about two versions of Parkinson's that inevitably develop. And it's all about the balance of NAD and methyl groups. And if you have a lot of NAD and no, or a lot of niacin and no methyl groups, you get one kind of problem. And if you have a lot of methylation and no NAD, you get a different type of problem. But it's all about mitochondria. And I'll read this. They say, accumulating evidence points to the probability that aging diseases such as Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, cancers, and metabolic disease originate in mitochondrial depolarizations and uncouplings with disturbed electron-proton flows as protonopathies, and uh, their consequent effects on ATP. A unifying explanation imagines abnormally spreading metabolic fields if the challenges of balancing 
NAD dependent energy supply and the demands needed for optimal methyl, methyl group availability. So those two have to be balanced to raise the whole potential of your human biology. So whenever we feed NAD, we also feed methylation and that be can become an individualized aspect of that. Now, I want to switch over in the last 10 minutes and talk about post-COVID syndromes and uh, neuroinflammation. So what are the kind of things that you see in people uh, after COVID? And I'm sure this is after uh, vaccines as well. Headache or dizziness, fatigue, brain fog, trouble concentrating, word recall issues. There might be joint stiffness, muscle pain, weakness, continued uh, breathing irregularities and congestion, heart irregularities, food sensitivities. We see a lot of mast cell activation uh, when people eat post-COVID. There's such a, a propensity of the system to wind up inflammation. And recurring symptoms of viral infections from other activated viruses. Uh, mechanisms that we've looked at already, NRF2 suppression. ACE2 disruption, so imbalancing ACE, so ACE1 is up and ACE2 is down, NAD disruption, and blocked uh, AMPK. So in all this, you're going to have uh, toxemias, free radical stress. When NRF2 is downregulated, you're going to have a lot of oxidative stress going on. Vitamin C is going to be your friend, amongst other things. The general toxemia from the lack of detoxification, reduced inflammation control, liver enzyme increases, uh, poor metabolic control. In fact, you know, people uh, who usually fast a lot after COVID are going to need to eat more often and they're going to need to eat more carbs and they're going to need to take a lot of antioxidants. So we saw this before, uh, suppression of NRF2 and activation of it as a strategy against it. Coronavirus infection activating PARPs, remember, so that means that the coronavirus is, is uh, inducing genetic damage that's inducing the PARP expression and dysregulating NAD. You're going to need a lot of NAD to come from, back from this. And of course, who were the susceptible people? Those are already NAD poor people. If you have cardiometabolic disease, you have mitochondrial dysfunction and you have NAD disruptions. And so COVID-19, NAD deficiency may predispose the AIDS, obese, and type 2 diabetic to mortality. Here they say through the act, action on sirtuins, but think about AMPK sirtuins and NAD all going together. Now, neuroinflammation. We've talked about neuroinflammation a bunch. There's tons of neuroinflammation in COVID. Tons of it. And neuroinflammation is uh, when you get the activated form of microglias in the brain. Microglia are usually in there for remodeling, and they're good, uh, good players. And then all of a sudden, they start acting like peripheral immune cells and release all these pro-inflammatory mediators. So infections like viruses, Lyme, uh, beta amyloid, those are all activators, uh, those are all activators of the microglia, and uh, possibly then EMF is as well. But neuroinflammation becomes a two-way triggering mechanism. You've got the activated microglia, and then you've got the neurons. And the activated microglia secrete pro-inflammatory mediators, which irritate the neurons at the, glutamate, uh, at the glutamate receptors, causing glutamate excitotoxicity. And then those neurons release other mediators that irritate the microglia again. This is kind of, and then this, this just keeps going like this. It's kind of like having uh, you know, CNN and Fox News in a room together. They're just going to go and go and go and go. And so you can start this cycle with your great uh, glutamate excitotoxins, mercury, glyphosate, mold, or EMF, or you can start it with the, with the immune toxins like the, like the infections or the beta amyloid. But once that gets going, it's hard to stop, but it turns out CBD is great at stopping the whole cycle. Here we have CB, uh, CB2 receptor activation, uh, down, down regulates essentially uh, uh, neuroinflammation and uh, is concomitant to 
neuroprotection. So we're stopping that whole activation. Cannabinoid, uh, cannabidiol and other cannabinoids reduce microglial activation in vitro and in vivo, relevance to Alzheimer's disease. Cannabidiol in vivo blunts beta amyloid induced neuroinflammation by suppressing IL-1 beta and INOS expression. So uh, CBD stabilizes, it stabilizes the microglia and stops their expression of the pro-inflammatory mediators, and it stabilizes the glutamate receptors, also called NMDA receptors. It downregulates nuclear factor kappa beta, and it's also an NRF2 upregulator. So combining it with uh, you know, other protective things like glutathione and phosphatidylcholine will help stabilize that. Now, the thing that we found worked absolutely, absolutely, without a doubt, far and above just CBD alone, was a blend of CBD, curcumin, and boswellia, and beta caryophyllin. Now, curcumin, now one of the things I noticed about this formula is it kind of got you high. If you took a bunch of it, and there's a little CBD in there, when the curcumin was in there, it like really activated CB1, which is the neurological, the central nervous system cannabinoid receptor. CBD itself doesn't really work on that. It works more on CB2. And then I found this paper, CB1 receptor mediated endocannabinoid signaling, uh, novel targets of curcumin. So curcumin, is acting as a phytocannabinoid, and it's synergistic with CBD, and it's also well known as an NF-kappa beta blocker, an NF-2 upregulator, a whole inflammation blocker, and that turned out to be the most important thing uh, post-COVID and post-vaccine, uh, post uh, or during, during COVID, was that blend of CBD and curcumin. And I think it's because of the delivery systems. Yeah, this is free curcumin in the blood uh, in a microemulsion format. Uh, the line down here is curcumin out of powder and it doesn't, you don't get any free curcumin in. Then some of the other, the other systems like phytosomes uh, and other high uh, delivery systems also get free curcumin in. So using one of those along with CBD is a really amazing way to turn down that inflammation. When that inflammation turns down, everything just starts to fix itself. So we, we talk about two phases post-COVID. One was the rescue phase, either during it or right after. If NRF2 is down, you need a lot of uh, extra antioxidants. Uh, you can't rely on your endogenous ones. So vitamin C is really big, glutathione or NS, uh, N-acetylcysteine. Uh, you need a lot of that in there. And one thing to know about vitamin C and NRF2, vitamin C blocks NRF2 activation by quenching free radicals, and then NRF2 doesn't get upregulated. So if you want to upregulate NRF2, don't take NRF2 upregulators and vitamin C at the same time. And so in the beginning, we're not even trying to fix NRF2. We're just trying to soothe the system, pet it, calm it down. So we use a lot of C, glutathione precursors, a lot of NAD repletion, whether you use NMN or NR, uh, the inflammation control with the CBD and the curcumin, and a lot of PC. There's wicked damage to the membranes during all that inflammation, so you need to repair them. And then as you move forward, you can start upregulating NRF2 and AMPK and get those systems back online. Just don't take them at the same time as vitamin C. All right, that's all I got.